Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, for those of us who are participating, we do apologize. We've been just having a bit of trouble with this whole Zoom thing. Uh, but alhamdulillah, here we are. Uh, I do want to welcome everyone uh, to this uh, tafsir session, which is actually an idea of uh, one of our Mathaba uh, team members, Brother Umer. Uh, some of us may know that I have a regular tafsir session that goes on after Dhuhr at Maki Masjid every Sundays. But unfortunately, due to the current circumstances that we are facing, we've had to put all of those programs on hold. And, yet, and here's going to be the alternative, where inshallah, we will take that program online on this particular platform for the foreseeable future. The dates are going to be shared with you as to which days we're going to be inshallah um, having this program and holding this program. Um, but for those of us who are here and do attend the Maki Masjid program, uh, the difference between that program and this is there, what we're typically doing is we are um, going through a set of verses in a sequential fashion, and we're basically uh, closing towards the um, end of the Quran. So we've started from Surah Baqarah, Right now, we are uh, in the 19th juz somewhere. And basically, we just every Sunday, we cover the next one or two verses and have a dialogue and a spiritual discussion revolving it. This particular session is not going to be the same. In this particular session, what we are going to be doing is doing select verses from Surah Al-Anbiya, given our situation right now, and understanding that Every person in the past, no matter what their spiritual rank may be in Allah's eyes, they have all gone through different trials and tests. And uh, this is something that we need to be acquainted with, aware of, see what lessons we can draw from them. And as a result, we can also uh, uh, basically see how we can shape our lives to emulate those figures and, and incur the same results that they had achieved. Uh, so today, inshallah, we are going to be looking at um, uh, select verses of Surah Al-Anbiya. I'm not going to be going through this surah uh, verse by verse. We're going to be doing excerpts of this surah. We're going to go over select passages, inshallah. And then after that, you know, we'll work our way towards um, uh, different uh, themes and different topics of this particular surah. So... This particular surah is a Makki surah, meaning it was revealed before the Prophet wasallam had moved to Madinatul Munawwara. So you have to understand that in the Makkan phase, uh, there's going to be a lot of obstacles in the Prophet wasallam's path, a lot of challenges, okay? And because the Prophet wasallam was a, a minority, okay, in Makkatul Mukarramah, him and his group of believers, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in, they were in relatively small numbers. They were not a large community. Okay, and then when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi is going to move to Medina after 13 years of preaching in Makkah al-Mukarramah, that's where you're going to see his, uh, his uh, followership or basically the people who are now following him, the numbers rise. Okay, and then the, the dynamics is going to completely change of how the Prophet Sallallahu is going to uh, progress and advance in his mission that he has been given by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So in the Makkan phase as a minority facing challenges every day, roadblocks every day, uh, whether it's gonna be even abuse, uh, it could be abuse on a verbal level, sometimes at a physical level, whether it's going to be uh, being ostracized from society, uh, isolated. All of these different challenges came in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's way. And this is, this is what you need to understand. This is the best of humanity. Okay? Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Allah's best creation. And that's what the best of creation had to go through. Challenges, trials, tribulations. Because that's the system of Allah. That when you are now going to be on this path, the path to achieving success, you are going to have to go through different challenges, make different sacrifices, uh, adjust your lifestyle to achieve and accomplish the ultimate goal. Just like that we do in every single field of life. The bigger the um, goal, the bigger the, uh, I should say, the bigger the sacrifice we have to make. All right. And we're going to see that right now 
uh, in this surah. So the Prophet is not going to be coached by Allah as to how to get through these different trials and tribulations. And this is one of those surahs through which the Prophet is being coached. There's different uh, stories here of the Anbiya that would help both the Prophet and his followers get through challenging times like the ones that we are facing right now. Right? No one had seen this coming. Uh, I mean, we're just having this conversation a couple of days back that if someone one month ago told, told us that we're going to face a situation as the one that we're facing right now, we would have just brushed it off. We would have said, yeah, you know, you're over-exaggerating. But now, within a short period of time, it's become a reality. And we've had to make quick adjustments. And yes, it's coming with its anxieties, its pressures, and whatnot. So, uh, we are now going to then explore the surah and see the guidance that the Prophet ﷺ and his companions got when it comes to facing certain challenges and how they benefited from these, uh, from these stories. And as a result, we can also benefit. Remember, one is giving instructions, but instructions become more real and they also become easier to practice when there is an example of those instructions being applied. Okay, so here, we have instructions from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah periodically tells us different stories of people of the past so that now we, it can resonate with us. We can see an example and a model of how you follow through with those instructions. And then it makes it easier for us to apply it within our lives. Um, so today, in today's lesson, what I wanted to focus on was not so much the stories yet, I feel that this is a good time for us to realign ourselves with our foundation. Okay, this is a good time for us to go back to our roots. Let's, let's you know, like people are already said it, saying right now that uh, based on the current circumstances, we're gonna, it looks like society is gonna be pressing the reset button. Uh, some of us may have come across this verbiage. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing that we can do here. When it comes to understanding our faith, when it comes to understanding our Iman, it's good for us to go back to our roots, press the reset button and see how we can build ourselves, okay? Rather than um, uh, functioning on a foundation that may have certain cracks and weaknesses in it. So today what I wanna do is for us to go back to the beginning look at our foundation, repair the cracks, and then we can move forward when it comes to uh, uh, constructing a building on that foundation, right? Metaphorically speaking. So what I wanted us to do is focus on verse number 16. I'm gonna start from here. Now, for those of us who are at home, you may have a copy of the Quran. It'd be good if you have a copy of the Quran uh, in a translation that you're comfortable with whether it's the English language, whether it's the Urdu language, whatever language it may be, whatever uh, translation you are comfortable with, have that in front of you so we can follow along. So then at least a connection with the Quran is being developed, right? Rather, we don't want this to just be a lecture and a thing that is going to occupy your time, but it's something that will help us develop this connection with the words of Allah and this being a means for us to have uh, a strong bond with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's go right back to the beginning. And we look at verse number 16 of Surah Al-Anbiya. Surah Al-Anbiya, this is chapter 21 of the Quran. Okay. And we are exploring verse number 16. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this particular verse says, and first I will recite, A'udhu billahi minash shaytan rajeem, bismillahi rahman rahim وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا لَاعِبِينَ لَوْ أَرَدْنَا أَنْ نَتَّخِذَ لَهْوَا لَتَّخَذْنَاهُ مِنْ لَدُنَّا إِنْ كُنَّا فَاعِلِينَ Okay, so these are two verses I wanted to start our, uh, our discussion with. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what is he saying? وَمَا خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاءَ وَالْأَرْضَ We did not create the sky and earth and whatever is in between. Whatever, whatever realities are in between these two spaces, we did not create, create it as a pastime. It's not, it's not a game. It's not a sport. Okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it very clear that this cosmos you and I are a part of, the sky that's above us, the earth that is beneath us, and the system that is now functioning in between this, 
it's not being done because Allah just was bored na'udhu billah. Okay, doing something for sport. What does that mean? Uh, either you're doing it as a pastime, you're doing it because you, you are bored or you're doing it just for amusement, you're doing it because you want to have some fun. Allah did not create this whole system for that purpose. And he's making that clear. clear. We did not create this system in sport. So what does that mean? If it's not done in sport, which sometimes is meaningless and aimless, it means that there is an objective and a purpose behind this. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to elaborate on what that objective and what that purpose is in multiple verses, which inshallah we're going to explore. But understand that we got to get away uh, from defining or coming up with our own definitions of what the purpose of this cosmos is and align ourselves with the manufacturer's purpose, which is Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the manufacturer of this system. So now it's time for us to hear from him. Why did he create this system? Okay. So the first thing he's saying, We did not create the sky and the earth and whatever is in between it in sport. It wasn't something that we're doing for fun and as a pastime and as amusement. And Allah then elaborates on that. If we intended to adopt some type of a pastime, some type of amusement, lahwa, lahwa, this is a, a word that is used for something that has no real meaning to it. It's, it's being do, done for entertainment purposes, or it's being done uh, for the sake of pastime, for the sake of distraction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that this system and everything that's there, we didn't create it with that intention. If we wanted to do that, we didn't have to go through all of this. We didn't have to create all of this. There was no need for, uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to create this beautiful system, which until today, we are perplexed over the more and more we learn about it. We become astonished. We are amazed. Okay, the more we learn about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making it very clear. If we needed to do something like that, if it was just a matter of having a bit of, a bit of entertainment, okay? okay, we would have adopted that from what is around us. Wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to take advantage of, create, and basically keep it in pro close proximity, he could have done that. Instead of now having this entire system made, which is until now uh, not completely understood by us. There's so much that is going on in the system. The system is continuously expanding, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it very clear, wa inna la musi'un, we're expanding it. And obviously you hear scientists saying the same thing. Uh, well, we didn't have to do all of this for the sake of a pastime. So I'm emphasizing this point over and over again for us to understand that there is a great objective behind the system that you and I are a part of, okay? So therefore, we need to recognize that objective, internalize that, and function in accordance to that in order for us to have a harmonious life. And if we're going to now not use something for the purpose, for its intended purpose, then what do you get at the end? Disaster, chaos, okay? So this is exactly what we see. So for example, if I'm going to use this phone that you see in front of me for the purpose of what? Communication, uh, sending messages and so forth, then I'll be able to benefit from this. However, if I'm going to use this, say for example now, um, uh, I want to break a window, okay? Or I want to use it to, uh, to, to probably uh, eat. I want to consume it because I'm going crazy. So I'm going to smash it. I'm going to take pieces of it and I'm going to begin to consume it. This is a radical, this is a crazy example. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I'm going to be remaining healthy very long because this is not the intention of manufacturing this. Okay. So we need to understand that if in order to attain maximum benefit from anything that is in our reach, you have to understand what its objective is, understand how it's supposed to be used, how it's meant to be used, and then use it accordingly. And everything will function okay. The more moment you start meddling with it, then things begin to go array. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that, um, if we had intended to adopt some form of amusement, we would have done it with what is by us. In kunna fa'in, if we were to do it, 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not done it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a creator that is full of hikmah. That's why he calls himself Hakim. None of the actions of Allah are done aimlessly. Understand this. None of the actions of Allah are executed aimlessly. Everything is done with precision. Every done thing is done with an objective. Everything is done with a solid purpose. Okay? So what we are facing right now, there's an objective behind it. There's a purpose behind it. All right? And what that is, well, we can expand on that and explore on that as we progress. Now, after creating this, this is an important thing. So no human on this earth is responsible for the creation of this cosmos, nor can anyone claim that. So when they are not responsible, they don't have any power over the creation, nor can they claim that, guess what? They also don't have control over the cosmos. They are given limited access as to what they can do and what they cannot do. That's all of us. We have limited access. There's only so much that we can do and all of a sudden we're going to hit a brick wall. We're going to hit a glass ceiling. That's like our limit is so much. But so we have, we have the ability to maneuver and use to a certain extent, but do we have complete control? The answer is no. We don't have complete control. Does Allah have complete control? Of course he does. He manufactured it, he made it, and then what does he do? He manages it. And that is something you can actually see explicitly mentioned when you go back to Surah Yunus. In Surah Yunus, uh, which is chapter number 10 of the Quran, chapter number 10 of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in verse number 3, chapter 10, verse number 3, he tells us now that when it came to the manufacturing of this entire cosmos, he says, "Inna Rabbakum Allahu ladi khalaq al-samawati wal-arda fi sittati ayamin, thumma stawa ala al-arsh yudabbiru al-amr, yudabbiru al-amr." So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala saying that indeed your sustainer, your maker, is the very Allah who created the skies and the earth, all the different layers of skies that exist, the earth that you and I are residing on. The sole maker and creator and manufacturer of that is Allah. Nothing else, no one else. Whatever humans create, keep this in mind, whatever humans create, it's from the resources of the earth. They can't make something out of thin air. They have to benefit from one of the resources of the earth, and that's why you have the fights all the time in every era between different nations and communities, the fight for the gain of resources, whether it's going to be oil, whether it's going to be gold, or whether it's going to be nickel, or whether it's going to be some type of metals, whether it's going to be minerals. You can't produce, no human can produce something out of thin air. They have to use the resources which are around them, under them, over them, in order for them to make something. Okay, so this is what Allah subhanahu is saying, that this thing that you are now extracting things from and making them, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation. It's his product. Okay, and then after that, he gives us a timeline, which then makes us appreciate Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even more, that this, this complicated and this intricate system I mean, any one of us, you go to any field of science and the more you study, the more mind boggled you become as to how intricate the, uh, and how detailed these systems are, whether it's the human body, whether it's going to be uh, thing, the, the things that you see in nature. Uh, it's, it's just completely mind boggling as to what you discover. And Allah subhanahu wa saying that he did all of this within a span of six days. Now remember, the day as we know it was non-existent at that time because day is defined by the rotation of the sun, the rotation of uh, the months are uh, defined by the rotation of the moon, if we're going according to the lunar calendar and whatnot, okay, the uh, earth's rotation around the sun, uh, earth spinning, the, you know, basically there's, uh, there's all this entire system through which we are able to identify 24 hours. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that, that what this, the time span that we would equate to six days is the amount of time that he made this entire cosmos because he felt like taking that much time, right? It's not like he was bound by that time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's system is kun fayakun, be and it is. 
However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to go ahead and take this amount of time, six days, which is less than a week. And wow, subhanAllah, you have this thing functioning, all those eons, Allah knows how long this has been uh, in function for, harmoniously, okay, the entire cosmos without change, with consistency, that's mind boggling. Okay, all of that, if we get a school project and a school project, it basically takes so much of our time. Okay, uh, and that's like just putting a few things together and trying to make a nice presentation. Forget this entire cosmos. Okay, trying to just make one factory, trying to establish a business. You know how much time and energy that takes and then trying to put the effort to make it successful and you know, modeling other, other blueprints that are out there. Okay, seeing best practices of other companies and borrowing that. None of this existed before Allah. There was no other, there's no blueprint that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was following. There's no manual that Allah downloaded from a particular website. There was no basically uh, best practices of other gods that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can borrow from. Basically, it came into being the way Allah designed it. And he tells us in other verses how he designed it. He designs it. It's functioning perfectly. Here we are. But uh, what are we doing with it? Are we using it the way it has been designed to be used? Or are we meddling with it? Are we playing around with it in a way, in the name of exploration? And, you know, when we have no God in front of us to be accountable to, then we have no compass, okay? That our compass becomes what our, uh, our desires may be. And guess what? The desires have no compass. They basically go in every direction, okay? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَامِ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ then after that, he went upon the throne in a manner that befits him. Remember, there are no examples that we can give of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is positioned like this or that because there are no, uh, there, there are no, um, uh, there's nothing that is like Allah. Allah says, Laysa kamithlihi shay. There's nothing like his like because he doesn't have a like. Okay, so, This is the part I wanted to focus on. Yudabbirul amr. He's managing the affair. In other words, when it comes to managing this entire cosmos, Allah is doing it alone. Allah is not taking assistance from you and I. He doesn't need the assistance of angels. Yes, he designates jobs, okay? The managing the system. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is complete in complete control. Now, person is gonna ask, well, if Allah is in complete control, then why the chaos? Why the chaos? This is something that especially those people who um don't believe in any God love to say that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really there, then why all this war, sickness, and whatnot? You know, it's a whole list of world problems. Why is that? Um you know what? It, that's easily answered. How so? If you were to go into um, further on, okay. Let me just quickly take that verse out. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says further on in Surah Yunus. And I want you to, um, yeah. I want you to go to verse number uh, 24, okay? I want you to go to verse number 24 of Surah Yunus before we go back to Surah to Anbiya. And the reason, again, I'm going back and forth because we need to explain a point. We're elaborating. This is how tafsir is pretty much done. You, you, in the, when you want to elaborate on a verse, 
you look at other verses for more information and then you couple them and then there you get your explanation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now telling us that إِنَّمَا مَثَلُ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا كَمَا إِنْ أَنزَلْنَاهُ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَاخْتَلَطَ بِهِ نَبَاتُ الْأَرْضِ مِمَّا يَأْكُلُ النَّاسُ وَالْأَنْعَامِ Okay, I'm seeing something here in the chat. Okay. So um, what we have here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us what this worldly life is like. This will, this will really under, make us and help us understand uh, why things work the way they work. So Allah says the example of the worldly life, that's your life, my life, every human's life. It's like water that we have sent down from the sky. This water is now going to be the, the, sorry, the vegetation of the earth is going to mix with that water, okay, from amongst the things that people eat and livestock eat. So that's going to be produce now, okay. So let's, let's understand this verse right now. The first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that the worldly life, it's, it's very similar to the investments that you and I make into this life, okay. You going to start from a zero you're going to start from nothing and that's like from our childhood okay we start from zero and then after that what are we doing we're investing our investing our energy uh we have to, we can start making our own investments inside us when it comes to financial uh, the financial aspects so what is happening you basically have you start from nothing. You make investments and it turns into a something. You work on it more and then you beautify it. So whether it's going to be my educational pursuits, I start off from ABC, I start off, I finish off with a PhD, okay? Uh, I start off, say, say, for example, in a business, I start off with mass loans and finally I end up with a successful business that is now uh, praised by uh, every major platform that is out there. So. You, there's investments, same thing. Allah is saying, this is what the worldly life is like. You have this, the, the rain coming from the sky. It mixes into the earth. As it mixes, what's happening? It's fertilizing the seeds that are there. And as a result, when this, this connection happens between rainwater and the seeds inside the earth, what happens? Growth, okay? You're now going to see this vegetation. You're going to see produce. You're going to see fruits, vegetables. All of this is starting to come out. Okay? So you're investing. You're investing. <laughs> Till the point that the earth it now it, it adopts and takes up its beauty. Okay? So now, because we live a city life, we're not constantly in contact we probably are mildly in contact if any contact with how farming goes to see farming okay see it in the beginning and after that you're actually seeing the fruits and the crops come out and you see them blossom and bloom right the whole the the whole cycle of growth it's not something you and i are accustomed to see but it's something i would invite you that it's it, it is uh something that's eye-opening so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that now after all these investments, okay, the farmer putting his time in it, taking care of the, of, the, of the land, taking care of the farm, making sure he does what it takes to get a successful yield, a successful produce, a successful harvest, I should say. It's now become beautiful. It's something that is pleasant to look at, just like when it comes to the different fields of our life. We invested, we basically went ahead and spent our time in it, and now finally we're tasting success. Okay, we're seeing the beauty of success, that my objective has been fulfilled, my, my investments have now come into fruition. All of this is happening. Now what happens is the human, they get so focused, so laser focused in the building of this particular uh, crop. Let's put it like that because we're trying to keep, uh, keep as close as we can to uh, the, the thing, example that the Quran is giving. So now what is happening? You're putting so much time and energy and you're seeing things go your way that all of a sudden you feel that you're invincible. 
You feel that I am com in complete control. Nothing can happen to me. If something happens, it's so unlikely. Yet it's happening to people. It's happening in other places of the world. It's not going to happen to me. Okay? What they lose sight of, of is we are not managers. Allah is the sole manager. He gave us the ability. Go ahead. Right now, we've given you some resources. Let's go ahead and use them. Let's see what you make out of it. Okay? And then when you get completely lost, and in, the, in that uh, thing, in that path, uh, as we are lost, we are under the assumption we are in complete control. And as a result of that control, guess what? We're turning our backs to Allah. We're turning our backs to His instructions because what? Things are going my way. Why do I need to pay attention to this? I'm living life on my terms. Why do I have to live life on someone else's terms? Okay. So, this life of mindlessness and heedlessness is continuing until Allah Subh'anaHu Wa is saying that our command comes either at night time or daytime. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can send something so minute or something huge that disrupts the system completely. And that sense of being invincible is gone like that. Okay? So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us. That this is what the worldly life is. We're making investments. We're putting time and energy into things which is not part of our purpose. And as a result of that, we develop the sense of becoming invincible. Okay, that we're untouchable. Nothing is going to happen. We're secure. We've done everything that it takes to make sure that not only am I secure, but my future generations are secure. We take all those steps. And then all of a sudden, within a flick of a, of a finger, as we, you, you and I, we are witnessing right now, life completely changes. Completely changes. Okay, so ataha amruna laylan aw nahara. Our command comes whether at nighttime, whether at daytime, that's left in Allah's discretion, how He wants to deal with different communities in different ways, different timelines. And he takes us back to the example of the of the farm. Okay, because what happens after the after the harvest, everything all, all the say, for example, the produce has been uh, removed. What does everything turn into? It turns into hay that's lying around. Hasida. It's just lying around. And I'm, I'm sure like, uh, those of us who may be living in Brampton, if you're to go towards the north, uh, say, for example, you visit Downey Farm. Uh, when you go there, after the harvest season, you see nothing but straws everywhere. So much so it's sometimes even inconvenient to walk on them. Okay. What was just a, a week ago looking so beautiful, now it's something that's unpleasant so what does this mean a complete turnaround of the system and guess what there is absolutely no control of that okay so as if nothing basically had existed the day before okay so what i need all of us to understand the point that we're trying to make here is that in the system we may feel at particular times that we are invincible, we're in complete control. Everything is within our hands. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then just makes a small alteration and then gets us to realize that no, the grand manager is Allah and he gives us an opportunity through which we can go ahead and make something of our lives, whether we're going to abuse it or use it, that's really left to our discretion. So, that's the one point I wanted to, us to, to walk away with today. That when it comes to the system, it's got a grand purpose to it. When it comes to who's managing the system, it's none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we know, if this part is understood, then understanding the actions of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wa when they're facing adversity, makes sense. Okay? It then, because it, it gets easier for us to process and digest. So now, I know at 3.45 you said we're supposed to take questions. I'm going to extend it for five minutes more because we started 10 minutes late due to the technical uh, difficulties we're facing and trying to get online. Uh, so I'll take it five minutes more, inshallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, going back to Surah Al-Anbiya, going back to that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also makes another thing very clear. Okay. Um, 
you know what I'll, um, what I'll do today is I'll skip over the verses I did prepare and I'm just going to finish off uh, another thing here. If we go to verse number 34, okay, go to verse number 34 and then 35. The first thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is that he has not made any human immortal. وَمَا جَعَلْنَا لِبَشَرٍ مِّنْ قَبْلِكَ الْخُلْدِ there is absolutely no human which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made that is, mort that is immortal. We are all mortals. We're going to finish. But there's no human that is immortal. So now what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, If you die, do you think those people who are not embracing your message, they're going to live forever? No, we're all going to face an end. Message here is, yes, we do have an end that we need to be cognizant of. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reinforces that in the next verse. Every single soul is going to taste the death, right? They're going to taste it. They're going to experience it. They're going to go through it. That is a reality that we just need to remind ourselves of. We are all headed to this one common destination. And that is the destination of moving from this world to the next. Okay, that's basically going to be a transition. But this is the point I wanted to focus on. We are going to test you through adversity and good. Shar really means evil. So I would, I would translate it as something unfavorable. So we're going to taste you. We're going to test you, sorry. We're going to test you through unfavorable and favorable tests. Sharri wal khairi fitna. Fitna means tests. So there's going to be tests through which our sabr is going to be tested. Okay, like right now. And then there's going to be tests through which our shukr is going to be tested. Such as before this came and we were living a relatively comfortable life, okay, a worry free life. Then what happens at the end? Wa ilayna turja'un. Every single one of you is going to be returned to us. Okay, every single one of you is going to be returned to us. So when it comes to facing these different uh, situations, as volatile as they may be, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan for us already. Okay, when ablukum bisharri wal khairi fitna, different tests are going to come our way. And how do we manage ourselves in those tests? That's what we're going to learn now from the stories of the Anbiya alayhimu salatu wasalam, which is going to be put forth. You're going to see situations where people are dealing with uh, isolation, loss of, uh, loss of health, uh, basically not having the ability to continue your progeny. Uh, there's going to be a whole different bunch of scenarios that we will explore. However, I do want to elaborate on a few other points before we actually start the stories in the next session, inshallah. And that is what we have established so far is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manufactured the system with a grand objective. He is upon creating it, managing it as well. And upon managing it is also, it's also important for us to understand what is that objective. Okay, what is the objective of creating this cosmos? What is the objective of creating you and I? This thing, when ablukum bishari wal khairi fitna, that's a process. Okay, testing us, you know, in good times and bad times, adversity and prosperity. What's the end? What is the uh, end goal behind this? That is something, inshallah, I want to focus on in our next session when we explore other verses before coming back to Surah Al Anbiya, inshallah. So. Inshallah, what we want to understand, what we want to walk away with on a practical level is that we turn right now to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as is going to be instructed going forward. In this time of adversity, this is when ablukum bishar, the, the test that is not so pleasant. Okay, it's things are not going our way. We're going to be facing financial difficulties. We're going to be facing social difficulties. We're going to see life as we're seeing it right now completely different to what we are accustomed to seeing. All of these adjustments are being made. Okay, now we're basically, now we're getting situations where we are being more and more pushed to stay off the streets, as staying indoors. It's like being incarcerated all of a sudden. That in itself is a test. How are we going to manage ourselves in this? And what is the whole purpose behind this test? We, inshallah, 
will definitely think elaborate on this, but inshallah, practically speaking, turn to Allah right now and don't think that there's no end to this. There is an end to it. There's an end to everything. But what the end is going to look like is highly dependent on how you act right now. And how do we act, want to act right now? It's going to be in a positive way. We want to act in a way uh, that we are exercising patience, which is self-restraint from letting our emotions go loose. We want to make sure that we are increasing our du'as to Allah. We are now rectifying our spiritual activities, the areas that we were neglecting. Now let's basically uh, focus on them. We've got more time at home, relatively speaking. Let's focus on building that spirituality. Let's focus on building that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a result of that, we will get more favorable outcomes from this whole experience than non-favorable outcomes, inshallah. So I will conclude with that. It's 3.51. Uh, so today we are, we are going to, inshallah, give you 10 minutes, well, nine minutes, inshallah, for questions. Uh, and uh, let's see what we can address. Okay, so we have one question. If it's kun fayakun, then why six days? Exactly what we just explained. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to the way he wants to go about executing things, that's really left to his discretion. He's got the choice of making things happen just like this in an instant, or he can take his time and having things produced. So like, for example, when it comes to us, the way we were developed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can make us appear just like that on the earth, or put us through a process of being in our mother's womb for nine months, okay, 40 weeks approximately, before we come out in this world. That's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's process, right? So he chose to do it in this way, just like he chose to, for us to be in our mother's womb for nine months, okay? Well, it's, this is left to his discretion, okay? And so does he have to provide a rationale behind that? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go ahead and, and basically uh, think, um, uh, execute the way he sees fit. But what we do understand from this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, uh, when he goes about executing something, it's always done with wisdom. That wisdom doesn't necessarily have to manifest in front of us. If Allah wants to share it, that's fine. If he doesn't, he's not accountable to us. We are accountable to him. It says here, in a perspective of an atheist, if Allah created mankind to worship him, then what does he gain from that? Why did he create heaven and hell just for mankind? Well, that's something I am going to elaborate on, on the next, uh, in the next week. But just uh, to basically uh, go away with this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gets nothing from this. Allah gets absolutely nothing okay, from us worshiping. He doesn't need our worship. And that's one of the verses I skipped over, which inshallah we'll go over. If you look at verse number 19 of Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ample worship going on of his. He doesn't require, he doesn't require our worship. Okay, so what is it? What is the objective then? Okay, so inshallah we're going to elaborate on that next week, inshallah. But uh, keep this in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has resources. Getting access to those resources, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will stipulate conditions. Okay? Will stipulate conditions. Just like, for example, you go to a uh, thing, um, the store. You go to Walmart. You want something from the shelf. You can have it, but it comes with a condition. And that condition is a price. Okay, whatever the price tag is, you may you basically have to go and pay that, and then you can use as you wish. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created okay, the, these systems of hell and heaven and so forth. He's created those systems. If a person wants to go ahead and avail of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, well, he's put some stipulations and conditions to gain access to something that is endless. Okay, so making a person work for it, just like we have to work for everything in this world. And again, I'm going to elaborate on this more next week, inshallah, when we cover those actual verses. So it's not a matter of just worshipping, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs our worship. He doesn't, and he gets nothing out of our worship. We are getting what we get through these particular acts and duties that we execute, inshallah. Current situation... This is a test from Allah, as you said, is also in adab as it's happening all over the world. Yes, of course. Um, 
if you remember, if, uh, if those of us were in my last Juma that I had a thing um, uh, conducted, not last Juma, but the, the Juma before, uh, we read out the hadith, right, of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where Aisha radiallahu anha is asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about ta'un, what is this? Okay, and then what did, what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? He said that he, to the near meaning, and I'm going to quote it to the best of my knowledge, Okay, so this is what's going to basically make us understand. He said, Ta'un, right? What is Ta'un? Ta'un is a, a swiftly spreading contagious disease. Okay, swiftly spreading contagious disease. That's what Corona is right now. Okay, and then when it becomes something that's widespread to the extent that it's now affecting an entire nation, an entire region, then it becomes a pandemic. So the, this ta'un, uh, Aisha radiallahu anha wants to know what is the reality behind this. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says that it is a punishment who Allah directs at who He likes. Okay, whoever He wishes to direct this to, He will direct it to. So in what in what sense will this now become a punishment? That individual, now that they've been afflicted and they've been living a life of sin, two things are going to be happening. Number one, they don't have the ability to do tawbah anymore. Okay, their time is up. And number two, they're going to be live, live, leaving this world in an unfavorable fashion. Okay, so that's the adab component. But وَجَعَلَهُ رَحْمَةً لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ He's made it a mercy for the believers. Meaning when the believer gets hit, the believer gets affected. Okay, if they have been now living a life of obedience day in and day out, they've been doing istighfar and tawbah, and now they're getting hit. What this is doing, it's cleansing them. If they have any outstanding sins, minor sins, it will cleanse them from the outstanding sins. And if they don't have any sins, because mashallah, every day they're doing tawbah and istighfar. This is now being, this is serving as a means for their ranks to be elevated in the hereafter. So it's a rahmah for the, for the believers. And then the Prophet ﷺ then tells us how to manage ourselves. Okay, that, um, uh, that if a person is now going to, uh, so for, okay, there is no individual uh, that, uh, that uh, is going to stay in this, in this particular ta'un. Uh, okay, he stays inside this, remains inside this in a state of patience and expecting reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, ex for exercising patience, like you and I are doing right now. We're having to be patient. We're having to adjust our lifestyles. We're having to adjust everything as we know it. This requires a, a lot of restraint on ourselves, on our, uh, on our behalf. And then after that, what are we doing? We're expecting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does compensate us for this because we believe in the promises of Allah. Muhtasiba. And the person knows that nothing is going to afflict them except through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. Nothing is going to afflict them except through Allah's will. They know that. So therefore, they're, they're, from a psychological standpoint, they're sound. They're not, they're not living in a state of anxiety and fear. They're doing what is required of them and then they leave the rest to Allah. We're doing what is required of us right now, for example, social distancing and so forth, then we leave the rest to Allah. If we get afflicted, we get afflicted. But we've taken our precautions and our measures based on the instructions that were given to us. So long as we're doing it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, فَلَهُ مِثْلُ أَجْلِ شَهِيدٍ This individual is going to be rewarded as if they are a martyr. The whole process, they are, they are basically in the same ranks as a person that's given their life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's cause, which is no small rank, because what does that mean? If we die, you know, if this is destined for us, we die in the state, we are going to be given that rank, that grand rank uh, in the hereafter, which is basically what we're all working towards, the betterment of the hereafter. Uh, so hopefully this sheds a bit more light on this situation. Again, there's so much to discuss and we've got a lot more to discuss. So inshallah, we are going to see you here next Sunday at three o'clock. Hopefully we can start uh, sharp on three o'clock without any disruptions of having to go back and forth. Uh, but inshallah, uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing you all there, inshallah. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.